Wow. See, Children's Church isn't the only great ministry we have here. <laughs> we got so many great things happening. I'm just so excited what God is doing. Uh, if we're just uh, going to take up tithes and offering, I'm just uh, going to say that, you know, um, I want to thank you guys for supporting uh, River City Church and what God is doing. We have some great stuff ahead of us. And I uh, ask that, you know, if you can, sew in. We got some expenses with uh, with uh, bringing Jeremiah in. And and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll just uh, say God will provide for everything that we need, right? And so um, if you can do that, that would be great. Um, let's just pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your provision and what you've given towards uh, towards your people, Lord. And you just never stop giving, oh, God. And Father God, we just want to reciprocate our uh, thanks to you and, Lord, also what is entitled to you, O oh God. Because it's not our money. Lord, you just give it to us to steward. So, Father God, we just thank you. Thank you uh, for this uh, opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, boys, thanks. What's that? Oh, yeah, debit. Uh, we do have a debit machine, you know, at the cafe. So if you need to use that, you know, you're welcome to. So um, it's pretty easy. You just go there, put your card in, and put a bunch of zeros after. No. Uh, it's it's uh, at the cafe. So it's pretty easy, self-explanatory there to do. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just uh, take a minute just to refocus on the, on the Lord here. If you don't mind, let's just uh, bow our heads and Heavenly Father, thank you for your church. Thank you, Lord. Buildeth in your people, Lord. Build your church, O oh God. Hallelujah. The title of my message is I Promise You, Don't Fear. And it's kind of. <laughs> It wasn't arranged, honestly. You know, like uh, when, when Todd came up here and he was talking about the fear. And uh, I'm going, yeah, well, we're on the same page. You know, God is doing something great with this church. And the thing is, um, I've got, I've got all, this, all these scriptures, and I'm not sure which ones I'm going to be pulling out as, as we go. But uh, the gist of the message is this. I'm going to be talking a little bit about our church. Maybe setting, I don't know, maybe setting a little bit, bit more vision. I'm kind of um, not only going from the seat of my pants of this one, but it's also the God has been preparing me at the same time. So if you understand what I'm trying to say, is I've got all this preparation and God is downloading all this stuff right now. And one of them is that we have been in a place as, as a church of change, continuous change. I can look out here uh, into the congregation, I can probably count on one hand how many people have been here a year ago. It's almost like, you know, we've had a reboot. And the thing is... Um, when, when, I, when I was uh, inquiring of God about all, the, all this, what's happening here, he was bringing to light that we were wa uh, wandering in the wilderness for a while as a church. I mean, I, I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of stories for you because uh, it's not about the stories. The stories that we're going to see are the ones in Scripture. That when we read the Bible, when we read the Scriptures, 
and, and we can apply what's going on in our lives and in our churches to what's going on in the Word. And that's really important for you to understand. That when we walk out our life, that we, it's not an uncommon thing that God brings a little bit of restlessness and, and uh, a little bit of a turmoil in your life in order to get you to the place where you need to be. In fact, sometimes what happens is get so uncomfortable with what God is doing around, you, around us, right, around you, that at times we try to decipher, is this God or it's not God, or, you know, uh, what, what uh, my default position of thinking is compared to what's happening. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's how, you know, our, our view of who God is compared to what's happening around you. We had, uh, or we read in Exodus how the children of Israel were in bondage for so many years. And that uh, their lives were agitated because they're in bondage. In fact, uh, they're crying out to God, and we can read into it. Uh, I'm not going to go into that scripture, but you can read about that And when you read the book of Exodus, that God heard the cries of the people. So what did he do? He commissioned Moses. He made a plan. And when he commissioned Moses... He was, he was setting out a plan for the redemption of Israel. And obviously, he took them out of slavery and bondage into freedom. But the thing is, you know the old adage, you can take someone out of Egypt, but you can't take the Egypt out of them. What that really means is our default thinking holds us back from, from freedom, right? So we have to be open enough to hear and see what God is doing. I mean, it was such a testimony for uh, Todd to come up here and say, you know, I had this default thinking that I had this fear. I, I know what gangs are like. I lived in a place where there are a bunch of gangs, and in fact, uh, Detroit and all that area, and coming here and walking the street and having this default thinking then facing a fear and all of a sudden speaking the word of God and things happen. This is where we want to get to as a people. You know, I'm tired of the way things were before. Stale, stagnant, not moving forward, dealing with uh, minor issues, issue-focused, we need to get up to a higher level of thinking and awareness of who God is in our life. You see, if we are always issue-based and issue-focused, that holds us back from moving forward. I mean, it's like we need to really get a life. You know, because what happens is you get so focused on petty issues and that becomes the primary focus instead of God. It's like the children of Israel when they came out of uh, the, the, um, the Egypt and they saw the Red Sea part, they see, they've seen all these terrific miracles. And then they get in there and they start whining. We really need to get to the place where we walk in the promises of God. And really, I mean, we need to get to the place, and, and, and I'm saying this carefully, okay? Because, I mean, there's things that we need to, you know, deal with in our life. But the thing is, we shouldn't be always praying for the same issues. We need to walk in some sort of victory. 
as people. You know, I love praying for people. I, lo- I love seeing God work. I-, I love seeing, you know, the funky chicken and everything else that goes on. When people, you know, just get touched by God. I mean, that's, that's awesome. But I'm telling you, we need to get to a higher place of normality. That God is, is taking the people of God into a place of authority. That they can walk in this authority and they can walk the streets of Edmonton and, and, and take authority of the darkness and evil. And whatever's going on, just like Todd was, was, was describing to us. So we need to get really to the place, you know, we need to give our heads a shake to the point where, you know, we need to lay down our selfish ambitions and the things that we focus on and focus on Jesus. God has given you a promise, and and don't fear because he did. Many times when we get into a new thing, uh, we're, we're scared, we're, we're fearful because we have all this default thinking that's going on. This happened, that happened, uh, I got hurt there, I got hurt over here. But we really need to get to the place that, that we trust in God and what he's doing around us and that he is going to you know, do some shaking in his church and in your life to get you to the place You know, like Hebrews says, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And we should welcome it. Because I want the things that are of God to remain in me. We need to be willing to to have the Lord come into our lives and, 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 and give us indication of what's going on in our hearts. We should be open to it. Because the promise isn't, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what's wrong just to show you what's wrong and, and to indicate how bad you are. God's not interested in that. He's interested in us coming to the place of victory and, and trust in believing Him for what He's going to do for us. Because what He's going to do for us is part of His plan. Just like, you know, Israel came out of Egypt to, uh, to go into the desert so that God can work in their lives and put a little bit of restlessness in them and to find out, you know, what's in their heart. And then I don't want to be the one who is uh, over 20 years old and have this type of thinking and to be left behind, to die in the wilderness. Because that's what happened. Those who were defaulted and, and were... were um, at this age where I'm not going to change, we're left behind. And the thing is, God wants to bring us to the place we, where we welcome change. I'm not saying welcome change for change's sake. We don't want to do that. We want to welcome change because God is working in our hearts and in our lives so that he can uh, bring us to a better place because there's a promise to get a hold of. This is where God is working. And if you know the character of God, his desire is to build into your life. He's not a, a God who wants to leave you behind. That's not God's heart. God's heart is to bring the people of God to the place where they need to be. Exodus 33 is a, a real good example, and I love, and, I've, and I've, I've preached on this before, and, and I'm going, God, do you really want me to do this again? He says, yes. Exodus chapter 33, the Lord said to Moses, get going. You and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt, go up to the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told them, I will give this land to your descendants. Who said that? God. Is there any higher authority than God? No. 
And I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to this land that flows with milk and honey, but I will not travel among you, for you are a stubborn, rebellious people. If, if I did, I would surely destroy you along the way. I'm like, what is going on here? But he's talking about the attitudes of the people. Just, just, just uh, the previous chapter, uh, Moses goes up into the mountain. He's gone for 40 days and 40 nights. And everybody's going, where's Moses? Well, there's some smoke going up there. Maybe he's puffed up. He's uh, exploded or something. I don't know what's going on. Where is Moses? And so they went to Aaron. Moses is right-hand person. That's, that, that just dumbfounds me. I read that, and how can you be so stupid, Aaron? Right? Because uh, the people came to him and said, we don't know where Moses is, so we need, we need a God. We need something that we can see that, so that this thing could, could lead us to where we need to go back to Egypt. And so Aaron's going, oh, well, I don't know what to do. Um, can I have all your gold? Let's just melt it down. Let's just, let's just form something out of it. Oh, we'll form a calf. Now, now, I really think there's some significance in the calf, but I'm not going to get into it today. So it forms it into a calf. And then this is what uh, God was saying. He says, the stubborn and rebellious people, why can't they get the promise that I gave, gave to them? Why can't they get it? And then we need to be a place that we can open our hearts and hear what God is saying. He's saying, listen, I've got a plan for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you. I'm going to get you through this. I'm going to bring you through the desert. They didn't want any part of it. They wanted to go around the desert. You know, it's just like I tell people when they come to know the Lord, God's not going to take trouble away from you. He's going to let you go through it, and he's going to give you the grace, and, and you're going to be better for it. See, they were prepared for that. They're okay eating their garlics and leek and, and being, being in this place where, you know, um, they didn't have to worry about, uh, you know, being stuck out in the desert. It's almost like, you know, I'm thinking... How many of us are comf comfortable being in the bondages that we're in? You know, I just, I'm thinking like, what are we thinking? Because there comes a point in, in, in time where you, you see that whatever you're doing is, is not that great. You know, there, there could be a better way. You know, and uh, I can I can say it a little more sterner if I if you want me to. It's like it stinks. It's a place that brings you down, binds you up, and yet you're in there, being whipped, but you don't want to move out of it. And then when God takes you out of it, it's just like you know cravings, or addiction, right? That that it pulls you back. But God wants to break those things. You need to get to a place where your heart receives what God wants to do for you. So here we have this scenario where everybody's going, Ooh, I don't know what's going to happen next, right? Because oh, God just said we're rebellious, right? Next is chapter 33, right? And so... It's, it says later, when the people heard it, uh, and the stern word coming from the Lord, that they kind of backed off and were kind of scared. They didn't wear their jewelry, or they, they just kind of backed off. And it's really quite, quite interesting because, you know, at that point, they go, I mean, Moses, you talk to God. Right? And it's almost like when you're in that position, you like to elevate somebody else in your life that they hear this word from God and you just kind of take from them. You know what I mean? 
I'm going to say to you that I am not any better than you are when it comes to God. I'm at the same level as you are. I am responsible for my actions just like you are. In fact, even greater because of the office that I hold. But you know what? You need to have that relationship with him. You need to know him. You, need, you can't stand afar off because this is what happened when these people saw all this stuff going on. Exodus chapter 33, 7. It was Moses' practice to take the tent of the meeting and set it up some distance from the camp. The tent of the meeting was a tent that precursed, like it was before the, the tabernacle of Moses, that he set up, that Moses went in there to commune and, and talk to God. So everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of the meeting outside of the camp. And notice that this tent was outside of the camp. I mean, if it was me, it would be right inside the camp. In fact, it would be the centerpiece of what, what's going on. That's why, you know, when we have church here, our central focus is on the presence of God. I don't want the presence of a, of a, of a, um, a personality or whatever. It's the presence of God that we need to focus on in this place. So everyone who went, well, had a request, they, they went to the tent, which is outside of the camp. I mean, what kind of thinking is that? But they, their thinking was, Moses, you go and you talk to God for us. So verse 8, whenever Moses went out to the tent of the meeting, all the people would get up and stand at the entrances of their own tent. I wonder if he's going to live this time. Ah, you made it. Whew, that was a close one. They would wa all watch Moses until he disappeared inside. And can you just think of that same, same um, mentality of be looking at Moses going into the tent, knowing the presence of God was there, compared to when he was on the mountain? What? <laughs> what? Uh. I wonder if they're, I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, I had a, a thought which I'm trying to get out of my head because I'm thinking that they were probably think, uh, taking uh, bets. Is he going to make it? Well, what kind of mentality would they have, right? So verse 10, when the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow down in the front of their tents. Inside the tent of the meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Afterward, Moses would return to the camp, and I just want to focus on this one now. But the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of the meeting. And why I want to target here is, you know, you got all the crowd out there who are standoffish from God. Yeah, they bent, uh, bowed down when they saw the presence of God and what's going on there. But they weren't near God. But you have here the heart of a man or of a boy, young man, Joshua. He remained behind in the tent of the meeting. And Joshua was the, other, was the guy who went up with Moses and went halfway up the mountain and when Moses on the mountain talking to God. What kind of experience did Joshua have? What kind of experience did he, did, did he have when, when he saw Moses speaking to God? And really, 
he started to know who the character, what the character of God was, who he, who he actually was, and what kind of a God was he. So he's lingering in the presence of God. Now, if, he, if God was this character who is uh, like the default thinking of the people, he'd be running out of that tent as soon as Moses left. But no, he was lingering in the presence of God. Lingering to, to, to do what? To experience his presence and his grace and his mercy and his get to know this God. Because he saw something different in, in this God that anybody else had because his thinking was different. He didn't have that default thinking that the others had. In fact, in Numbers chapter 13, we all know this story when the spies went out. When God said, listen, you know, send some men out to explore the land of Canaan. Right? And uh, get them to come back and give a report of what, what's out there. So they went out into the land of Canaan and they saw a whole bunch of great stuff. But their focus wasn't the promise. The focus was the issue. They came back with a report in verse 25 after exploring the land for 40 days. The men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel of Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported the whole community that, to the whole community that they had seen what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. This is their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent to explore and it's indeed a beautiful or bountiful country. It's awesome. It's fantastic. A land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the fruit it produces. But, and my wife always says, beware of the big butts. When everybody starts telling you that, all this great stuff, and they go, but, uh, that's where the warning sign comes up. Then you really find out what their heart is. But the people living there are so powerful and their towns are large and fortified. And we even saw giants there. The descendants of Anak, the Malachites live in the Negev, the Hittites and the Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. It's just like wine, 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 wine. You know what? If you're going into the promise, there's going to be some giants to fight. There's going to be some things you need to let, let go of. There's going to need some, some warfare to go happen. But because of that, it makes it worth it. Because God comes into your life and he empowers you to do it. Instead of going, you know, into your own mindset and your own way of thinking, thinking, how am I going to tackle it? There is no way. I like, I like to say that anything, any thought or any promise or anything you want to do, if it's, if it's something you can attain on your own, then it's not a God thought. God thinks bigger than what your mind thinks of. He's got a bigger plan than what we can even think of. In fact, you know, most of the people, or well, all the people here, they're going, oh my God. You know, God, you brought us here to get killed? That was their response. I don't think so. And unfortunately, when, when a church gets into that spot, and then you get into new territory, 
that you'll see who has that same heart to go after what God has put before you. And God works within his people to bring him to the place that he can reveal his promises and give them the vision that he has for them. This is what happened here. The people had no vision. They had no vision at all. Their vision was still defaulted back in Egypt. Well, if we go back there, at least we'll have some garlic and leek. And we won't get killed by the, by the Malachites and, and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Parasites. Uh, the Parasites and, and he goes like, we're looking at these giants and we look like grasshoppers. Gee, what kind of God do we serve? Is he not able to deal with these giants in our lives? Is he? You know, like, give your head a shake, you guys. I'm not talking to him, I'm talking to these guys. Verse 3 to say, spread this bad report, and it's just like anything else. The rumor mill starts. Hey, guess what? What? The pastor thinks that we should be doing this. We've never done that before. That can't be of God. That's just too big. And that's how these rumor mills start. We can't press in closer to God, like he said. We can't worship like that because we haven't done that that way before. We can't go walking on the streets. Is, are you, is that ridiculous or what? Someone's going to get killed. <laughs> you know, like, what's wrong with our religious brains? Take God out of your, the box that you built him in to and let him just do things with you. Be like uh, Joshua and Caleb. Because here we see in Numbers chapter 14 Joshua and Caleb. <laughs> they said this, verse 5. Moses and Aaron fell on their face to the ground before the whole community after they started murmuring and, and complaining. And are you kidding me? Two of the men had explored the land. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jep Zephunah, whatever, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Don't rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land, for they are only helpless. Pray for us. That's the word of God. Not what the word of your brain. It's the word of God saying, listen, stand up, get up. I've given you a promise. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. Go take it. Anything less is rebellion. Wow. Wow. I don't walk in the promises of God. That's rebellion. What? I don't enter into what God has for me. That's rebellion. 
Why is it rebellion? Because it's not disbelief. It's not faith. Because faith is what? It's stepping into it, yes. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's what it's all about. For he is not one who will be slack about his promise in your life. God is a God of promises, and God is a God who keeps them. It's us who fail. It's us who have to get back into line with God, with what God is doing. God is not the one who made the mistake. And no, he didn't make you a mistake. That's not a mistake. God has made you who you are so you can be who he has made you to be. But we see in verse 10, the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua. What are you talking about? It, it's amazing how many of us who want to declare the promises of God and, and just go deeper in with him, a lot of people say, hey, what do you think you're doing? It is fear. Because that's what was holding them back, was the fear. Joshua chapter 1. Ha. Joshua chapter 1. We see them coming to the Jordan River, ready to cross the Jordan. Who's in charge? Joshua. And Caleb's with them. Those are the only ones left from the original group of people that were 20, over, tw over the age of 20. A new gener generation had to get into the promised land. That old generation of thinking had to die off in the desert. And it's, uh, you know... It really speaks to how many people actually die in the desert places. They just can't find the manna. They just can't find the bread, the life of God. In fact, they, they get to the place where they don't, they don't trust the manna the, or the life. Joshua chapter 1. Verse 1, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people and the Israelites across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Whatever you set, uh, wherever you set your foot, you will be on the land I have given you. So wherever you set your foot is where God has given you the authority to be in. Amen. Isn't that crazy? You are here. You're setting foot upon this place, upon wherever you are, God is with you. He has given you the authority. Therefore, it is time that you lead these people Israelites across the Jordan River and into the land. Wow. You know, it's time. You know, I've been, uh, we've been saying for a long time, we're hearing the prophetic word a lot, saying that we're on the cusp of something. It's on the cusp of something really big. How many of you ever felt that? I have. That God is preparing his people for something really big really big. That even, there'll be one of the biggest revivals that would ever happen in, in, in the history of the church. But you know what? I'm saying that we're not even in on the cusp anywhere. We're entering in. And that's the mentality that we have to have as people. That we are entering into what God has promised. We're no longer cusping it. Because being on the cusp is being on that shoreline, 
you know, waiting for the River Jordan to part. It's parting now. We need to walk into that promised land. We need to walk as people of faith and what God has given to us to declare the goodness of God and for God to establish the promises in his people. And because this is the plan of God. Because you know what? The nations of the world are, 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 are they're, they're, they're healing. Everything is in your hands. Because God is using his church to bring the healing to the nations. He is bringing his church to the place where, where his church would be demonstrating, the, you know, the Jesus and who Christ is. Knowing the character of God like Joshua is essential. It's something that God really needs to instill in his people. We as the as people need to really know what his character is like in order to lead into that promised land, just like Joshua. Joshua was in a place before that prepared in the presence of God. He couldn't leave. He didn't want to leave when Moses was, was doing his, uh, uh, his dialogue with God. Moses leaves. Joshua lingers. Why? Because he fell in love with the character of God. He knew who God was. He had that intimate relationship with him. And that's why he could lead these people through. It says here, verse 6. And this is a word I think is for the church today. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Be strong, courageous. Mind uh, the character of God in your life. Know who he is. Get into, uh, th get into the word. Get to know who Jesus is. Come into the place where you can uh, commune with him and know him. It's not religion. It's not just knowing your Bible. It's knowing who God is. But you see who he is in the scriptures. You see who he is in the spirit. You see because you have a, a relationship. You have an encounter with him. And I plead for you, to, for you as a church to come to a place where you have an encounter with Jesus. Don't just know, just know, don't, just don't know about him. Don't just know that, yeah, he is God, but have that encounter with him. Then he can lead you in. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night. And so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then you will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. You know what? I'm going to tell you right now. If you're discouraged, that's attack, an attack from the enemy. Or you need to change how you think. We should be people with no room for discouragement. We need to be focused on what God is doing. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go.
Do you know, it's so cool. I love this story. Joshua chapter 2, they set out scouts. Why not for the same reason as before? They went to check out the land and how are we going to take this? We're going to do it. Then they went into Jericho. And what happened? Yeah, but there's a woman there. There was a woman there, Rahab. You know, Rahab would be one of these people that you just go by on the street and just say, oh, there's another hooker. Despised and used. But they went in and she was saved. In fact, you know, they said tie a scarlet thread so that when we come in and attack, we'll know that's your house. And you know what? If you look at the genealogy of Jesus, whose name is in there? So cool. A prostitute saved by the grace of God out of Jericho. So cool. You never know the impact that you're going to have beforehand until you walk in and just and see what God's going to do. So cool. The impact that you alone, don't dumb down yourself to the place that you think that you're so insignificant. Because you know what? God is able to use you in a mighty way. In ways that you don't even can comprehend. God made a way. And look at the blessing that came down from that. I want to I'm going to close off First Peter chapter 2. We can have the worship team come up. I read from ver uh, verse 1. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and unkind speech. He's talking about what we just talked about, the w our ways of thinking and our behavior. Because really, th behavior comes out of our thinking, right? Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Verse 4. You are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the meditation of Jesus Christ you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God 
as the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem chosen for great honor. And anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, who you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him, but for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble and rock that makes them fall. So he's the stone that those with that kind of thinking are stumbled over. They stumble over him. They stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. The ones who have fallen off away in the desert. But you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. And I love this part. Once you had no identity as people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, and now you have received God's mercy. given you his identity. He is the one building the church. He is the designer. And the thing is, when we enter into his promise, we need to deal with the fear that holds us back. Because fear and contempt will hold you back from where God wants you to go. We need to Know God's desire for you. And this is what we just read. He's made you into a holy nation. A royal priesthood. God's very own possession. Father, I just thank you. Build your church. Build us into that temple, Father God. Build us as living stones, O God. And Jesus Christ being our cornerstone. Father, we surrender our own selves and our our ways of thinking. Father God, we just pray that you would just change us, oh God. Bring us to the place where we don't fear change. And Father God, that we can just hold on to you and follow you and, and commune with you. Father God, help us to get into the place where we just want to desire to linger with you and know who you are. Just as Joshua did. Give us the heart of Joshua, Lord. And that we can see and know that God is for us, not against us. And that God can bring us through the things that we need to go through in order to reach the promise. We just thank you that, that in Jesus' name. Let's, let's stand up and worship a while.